Hello, I'm a gynecologist and, and, um, and, my, and I see some of these young women. And these vi virological uh, HV6 results seemed very promising. How rigorous are you in, in, in order of, of making the diagnosis? Is immunological uh, uh, enough or do you think that we should take the spinal fluid analysis always? Yeah, I get asked that question all the time. I think it's a really good one. If the, the problem with HHV6 variant A is it can be positive in the spinal fluid and, and absent in the serum. And there's a whole literature of that. So you might be missing these people by not doing a spinal tap. So that's why I go through the rigorous protocol to find these people and go step by step by step with the brain scan. And, the, uh, and I have found these people are positive in the cerebral spinal fluid and negative in the periphery. They will have high antibody titers. So that's a clue. If you run HHP6 antibody titers, they can be very high. And there's, a, there's just a new paper out about a sero serological test. And I don't know if it's commercially available. Maybe one of the infectious disease doctors knows this that differentiates HHV6A from B. And that would be a very useful serology if that, in, in fact, is available. You can do it by PCR, of course. So if you have a suspicion, you can, you can verify it by PCR. But those people are worth finding because they have such a dramatic clinical improvement. We were just discussing here whether or not we needed a five-minute break. you want to just break. go ahead? Yeah, I think we should just Which? continue on. Uh, just one question. You didn't mention like vitamin, vitamin D deficiency or vitamin B12, like some high dose treatment has been discussed. And yeah, uh, I didn't mention that because we screen for that, and that's one of those ancillary things that if they're present, we treat them. But I haven't seen myself. In the United States, vitamin D deficiency is quite common, as they expect it might be here in Sweden as well. Um, and I certainly do treat those people. We also look for thiamine and pyridoxine deficiency, because you will find people, especially the people with leaky gut syndrome, will have those deficiencies as well. Okay, well, we'll change up and... Right, just go ahead, I think. Go oh, ahead. Yeah. No. I would like to stimulate your interest and ask for your cooperation in this next presentation because I think these new horizons of what's going on now is what's really exciting and will ultimately solve this dilemma and, and solve some of the suffering and pain and disability associated with the disease process. And I could never uh, outline everything that's new in a very short presentation but I'll give you some vignettes into what's happening and then ask for your collaboration and help. And I am very excited about this and the concepts of translational medicine. So again, our scientific journey with looking at viruses, endotoxemia, intestinal dysbiosis, cytokine storm, low cell, cell function, oxidative stress, hydrogen sulfide production, mitochondrial dysfunction. These are all things that have now been documented to be part of this syndrome. And we're still lacking a single diagnostic test or a single approach to this. So 
people have been looking at novel ways of approaching this, and you've probably heard some of these. Again, we're skipping to the 2011 now, having this 30 years of history, or 100 years of history. And I just wanted to outline some of the new exciting stuff so that you uh, stay optimistic about this. One is the Schutzer spinal fluid study. Another one is molecular mimicry. Um, HHV6, which I talked a little about, chimerics, apoptotic serum DNA testing, and gene expression. And I'm not going to spend too much time on that because I want to go on to a translational model for you. This was a landmark study that was done by the Department of Defense. It was extremely expensive. It looked at spinal fluid protein analysis by mass spectroscopy in post-Lyme patients, in normal patients, and in ME patients. And interestingly, they found that you could clearly separate these groups based on analysis of their spinal fluid. That the ME patients had 600 and some proteins that were, or 730 that were unique to them. The post-Lyme patients had proteins that were unique to them. And the normals had proteins that were unique to them. So it was very interesting, but very expensive, very difficult to do. And this would never be a particular diagnostic uh, clinical tool. But it was very helpful with respect to showing that the patient's spinal fluid was different in those three different disorders. And here's just a graphic representation of how nicely they separated out and how you could clearly diagnose this uh, ME patients from the post-Lyme patients. And when you looked at those proteins, which was the obvious question, and you said, what was different about them? Why, why were these people different? You found that the <clears throat> uh, ME patients had abnormalities of the complement cascade and some signaling problems. And a decrease in the normal CNS proteins. So that makes some sense. You see this inflammation and absence of normal functional proteins. So if you, if you want to translate that into symptoms, that may well explain why the patients have such so many neurocognitive uh, complaints. Well, there was, uh, in the, we took this original study that had the herpes viruses uh, active, and I thought maybe molecular mimicry might be involved here, because that's one of the theories for the development of MS and a number of other autoimmune diseases. So again, this time we expanded and we looked for EBV, HHV6, and CMV by viral isolation. And again, the technique you've already seen before. And this time we got somewhat different numbers when we looked for viral isolation. We found all three herpes viruses again, and some of the patients had multiple infections. And then this was the interesting point. We went back and did um, autoimmune panels on all these patients. And much to my surprise, the patients had very strikingly elevated antibodies to a, a variety of, uh, of autoantibodies. We could take one, thyroid peroxidase. And according to the original definition, you had to exclude the patients who had a positive autoantibody. So for all these years, we were probably excluding people that were right in front of us that had this molecular mimicry going on. And these are complicated, but for any people who know genomics here, it turns out that, that thyroid peroxidase protein has a strong homology with EBV, HHV6, and CMV. Extreme genetic closeness between those proteins. So we looked for the Smith antigen. It's how you diagnose lupus. And we found the same homologies with HHV6, EB, and CMV. So then we looked at the myelin basic protein, which is how you diagnose MS. And we found the same homologies between those three herpes viruses. And then a peripheral neuropathy, human oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, same thing. So the conclusion was that EBV does seem to play a role in cross-reacting in the development of immune diseases. And that these leukotropic beta herpes viruses may be the inciting effect for this group of autoimmune symptoms that uh, many other patients uh, exhibit.
And then there's a whole literature about this role of HHV6 in enhancing and reactivating other viruses. And there's a whole, there's a lot of research going on in the United States with respect to this now. And I just gave you a little insight into that so you know which direction we're going. I found this little study interesting because this was done at a VA hospital and they found markedly elevated antibodies to HHV6 variant A in people with psychiatric disorders, particularly acute schizophrenia. So once again, this uh, particular variant A, which affects, it has a propensity to attack the central nervous system, may be playing a role, particularly when it's reactivated. Mm -hmm. I've already mentioned our hope for the future, this oral agent, Sadofavir, that's effective against uh, many of the herpes viruses and many of the adenoviruses and other viruses. Uh, we'll, we'll stay tuned about that. Maybe the next time I talk to you, we'll have some clinical trials about that. There's a um, exciting clinical trial we're waiting for from uh, your colleagues in Norway with respect to the use of rituxan, which I'm very interested about because if we're right about the molecular mimicry theory and the development of autoimmunity, a, an endpoint B cell blocker like that should be very, very effective. So I'm thinking that that's why they show the results from rituxan. And uh, what we're waiting for there is rituxan is a very expensive drug. In the United States, it's about $80,000 a year. So we need to see their studies about which patients responded and why they responded. And uh, we're working with Roche, the manufacturer, to try to do a tri clinical trial in ME. Apoptotic serum DNA testing, I bring this up as just one of the many kinds of things that's out there now. People are looking for markers. And this is uh, rapid pass-through testing that looks for the pro uh, products of dead cells. And uh, there's unique markers by whether that cell was killed by a virus or killed by a bacteria or killed by a tumor. And uh, many, many research labs in the United States are doing this now. Because they, if they find a marker for many, many diseases, this could be utilized. And this particular company, Chronix Biomarketing, is looking in MECFS and they feel they have a signature marker for apoptosis and uh, stay tuned for that one as well. It may turn out to be useful, it may not. Exercise testing, I promise to come back to this. There's now gene studies done post-exercise to try to figure out why these patients worsen with exercise. And they, they did find a decrease in transcription of alpha-2A receptor and differences in sensory and motor receptors in your messenger RNA. So this probably explains, at least through messenger RNA upregulation, why you're getting worse with exercise. What to do about it remains to be a problem, remains a problem. But uh, this is clear-cut evidence. It's, and, and the lights at University of Utah just received a large NIH grant to do further work on this. So this is very, very exciting for all of those who wondered why they're worsening with exercise. The XMRV story is a sad one in some ways. Xenotrophic viruses only affect cells from other species. The gamma retroviruses are ubiquitous. Uh, there's many, many, many of them never known to produce human disease. You all certainly know that there were two papers published that linked XMRV to ME chronic fatigue syndrome. There's at least 25 that have not found a link. So lack of evidence of XMRV in relation to chronic fatigue syndrome, the XMRV and MLVs could not be found in recent blood working group study in which they did blinded samples to different laboratories. And in fact, one of the laboratories found positives in controls and negative in spike controls. So I think the technology was just very poor or perhaps premature. Um, there was an issue of contamination 
and uh, the science paper was partially retracted due to contaminated specimens. It's, an in it's a very interesting virological story, but unfortunately I must conclude that that particular gamma retrovirus has no role in ME or in chronic fatigue syndrome. The door is open, however, for other uh, viruses to be involved. And, in fact, the f future research is uh, going to go ahead with uh, studies looking to try to isolate uh, a different gamma retrovirus from these particular patients. To summarize the XMRV research, the blood working group reported no detection in their studies. Uh, they found confusion amongst the laboratories that performed the testing, as I mentioned. So I'm excited to tell you, probably have heard from the internet that uh, the Ian Lipkin study has been funded and is up and running. And uh, he is the man who discovered SARS and has a very, very good uh, assay for most of the known human pathogens. And he has a very sophisticated technique to look for new novel pathogens. So. We're very, very excited about this study. If, uh, it's, I, I just can't wait to get his results back. And uh, like I say, it's ongoing. And uh, hopefully, we'll have some additional answers about the role of, human, of pathogens in the origin of uh, MACFS. We also are collaborating with Bond University to look at the defect in natural killer cell function. Uh, it's so reproducible in all the patients around the world. We want to know why that is. What is dysfunction about the NK cell? We know it doesn't produce the right amount of killer chemicals, but is it a genetic predisposition? Is something altering the function of the NK cell? We just don't know. And then, because of uh, interest in the spinal fluid that was generated by the protein study, we're now doing a spinal fluid study looking for pathogens. We're looking for, or, uh, for organisms that may be in the spinal fluid, and we're looking for cytokines, because we might be able to find a signature in the spinal fluid that could be matched in the serum that could get a diagnostic test that would be uh, very accurate. So now I want to make a plug for research networks, registries, and biobanking, because I think this is really how we're going to solve this, both from a diagnostic and from a therapeutic interventional point of view. And an example, and there's many of these springing up in other diseases in the United States, but it's the Open Medicine Institute in um, California. It's in Mountain View, Silicon Valley. They have all the technology that you would ever want uh, readily available. And what the concept here is, is that you can take clinical medicine, wet it to research, and get input from all over the world, and analyze that data worldwide and come up with answers much more quickly than any one center ever could and uh, could do effectively. And part of the attraction of this model is that you can use social networking, you can use biosampling, biotech and informatics in order to not only conduct research, but to conduct clinical medicine. Now this is a paradigm shift for American physicians, and we don't like it, but it's coming and you know we're being replaced by the supercomputers. But it really does get to the idea of collaborative translational research. And clinical medicine one is what we have all done for years and years. We see the patient, we make a diagnosis, we may or may not do tests, and then we follow some algorithm. If this, this, if this, this. And that's what's changing with the addition of biotechnology, databases, genomics, and we're developing what we call clinical medicine two that's based on all of that input uh, to make an individual recommendation for that patient rather than a cookbook, if this, do this, if this, do this. You're all familiar with the CDC recommendations for MECFS to do graded exercise in Prozac, both of which make patients worse. 
So that's the thing that we're, the approach that we're trying to avoid. And in fact, nosology is the branch of medicine that defines diseases. And historically, we've defined it on a bunch of symptoms or on a positive strip culture or something like that. What, uh, what these new technologies allow us to do now is to get a profile diagnosis, like I showed you with a cytokine profile or a viral profile, to redefine particularly some of these difficult diseases. So how do we apply this in general in medicine? Well, here's an example that's being used in the Bay Area right now in Silicon Valley for diagnosis of fever. We physicians all know that a fever can come from any number of things, particularly in a sick hospitalized patient. And we start looking and ordering this test and seeing what it shows and ordering this test and seeing what it shows and blah, 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 blah. And then we try to put in information and all those who have ever been hospital-based, this is not an atypical patient in the ICU where you're getting 100 pieces of information simultaneously and you're trying to make sense out of it. Well, what they did in the Bay Area for fever is they took all this input that's coming, they did messenger RNA, and they can tell you in the first 20 minutes what you're infected by if it's an infection. So E. coli sepsis or strep sepsis or whatever, and uh, have really simplified uh, the approach to ICU patients with fevers. So we thought this is the kind of model that we could apply to a very complex disease like MACFS, and we've been working on, uh, a long time on this. And what we we're missing is this central data processing core piece. We certainly there's enough clinicians out there that can provide the information from their patients. Uh, there's enough laboratories doing this laboratory work, but what we needed was the bioinformatics, the biostatistics, the technology, and the sampling, as well as a repository. So what we had done years ago is started collecting repositories, and that's where our spinal fluid analysis is coming from, is all the stored spinal fluid over the years, as well as the PBMCs and serums that are in a biobank now, so that any researcher who's associated with this biobank can access this information and, in fact, those specimens. So if somebody in Stockholm came up with an ID and said, I want to measure X, Y, or Z in 100 spinal fluids, they would have access to that biobank and they wouldn't have to wait for 100 people to get spinal taps, et cetera, et cetera. So it also shortens the course of research. And so the real concept of translational research that's coming about in other fields, and, I, and I, I think it's going to work here as well, is, and let's start in the left upper cor corner here, the patient has a portal into the system. So the patient can answer their questionnaires and all that long before they get to the office visit. And they can put anything in there they want to, the new drug, the surgery, the new doctor they're seeing, what, anything that's changed. This goes into a, a medical record, an electronic medical record, and it goes into the database de-identified so it can be used by other researchers. The laboratory data is automatically put into the database, so we're no longer scanning paper documents or entering CBCs manually, et cetera, et cetera. The research piece is de-identified, so the associated researchers, such as NIH or CDC, et cetera, have access to this information, but not the tracking to the individual patient. So that provides privacy, et cetera, for patients. And then for clinical trials, the researcher is, we have this database for clinical trials, so that when a drug company comes and says, find me all the people who have natural killer cell function of less than 1%, that also have HHV6 variant A reactivation, et cetera, we just key that in, and there we know what our, what our potential uh, patient population is. Well, what do we need for something like this to work? We need cooperative patients, which we certainly have. We need collaborative providers, where we have some but not enough. We need scientific rigor so that we don't re repeat the XMRV kind of story. We need innovation and core resources. And in some circumstances, like perhaps here, we need political will. We need the politicians to support us on this kind of project. Uh, both politically and financially. So under this model, there's an informatics infrastructure that automatically keeps track of the providers, the patients, the statistical information, the biospecimen tracking. The biosampling uh, techniques are there. 
Physicians know we have tax genes now that can uh, purify your DNA and RNA and we can freeze it forever and ever and ever and pull it out whenever we want to do something. The research infrastructure is there. There's a lot of uh, various expertise in all these different fields, uh, virology, immunology, etc. The data, again, is managed off an iPad. For, uh, that's very easy to use. It's pretty uh, user-friendly. Patients don't have so much trouble entering their stuff. I don't have so much trouble entering mine. And, uh, and you can query it fairly easily. And what this allows us to do in translational medicine in MECFS is do large-scale clinical data Currently, there's five physicians in this uh, centers involved in this, so we really can magnify any project we're doing and do it much, much quicker. And it, the patient has involvement as well. They're a participant in this. The centralized biospecimen collection and storage is essential for the reasons I told you. This is entering a greater database of, uh, like, hospital fevers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you want to compare your group of patients against some other group, let's say against MS, they're also in the biobank and in the data bank. And uh, the, the focus has actually been on chronic and syndromic diseases because those have been the most difficult to sort out and difficult to study and to get treatment protocols. And then, of course, the um, other part of this model is it accumulates a large amount of normals. So this issue of, well, what do normal controls have? If you have a biobank and a database, you can access that quite uh, easily. So the Open Medicine Institute just got a CDC grant to do this. And uh, so it's a great example, I think, of translational medicine. Each clinical site is going to follow about 100 patients for two years. Uh, extensively tracking everything that happens to them, every change they make in drug, every new development they make, every SF36 that they complete. Uh, again, there's laboratory tests and uh, instrumental questionnaires involved. This is updated by the patient and the physician and the laboratory, as I mentioned to you. And I think this will provide a, a platform for uh, quicker clinical trials and quicker drug trials and quicker diagnostic trials for everybody. And lastly, I do really, truly welcome collaboration with similar institutes, healthcare organizations, and governmental bodies internationally, including Sweden and the Scandinavian countries. We already have established a link with Australia, and we have other links in Europe. So I think this is the way of the future. I think it's really the way to go in this particular disease and maybe many, many diseases. And I thank you all for the hospitality and the opportunity to be here.